Yeah, uh, good morning, everybody, or oh, just gone afternoon. Uh, thanks very much for coming to join. Uh, my name is Nick Pentreath, I'm a principal engineer at IBM, and today we'll be talking about reinforcement learning as applied to recommendation and personalization. So a little bit about me. I'm ML Nick on Twitter and GitHub. I work at IBM in a team called the Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies, or CODE, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a, in a moment. I focus on machine learning, data science, and AI applications. Um, I've got a long history in the Apache Spark project, where I'm a committer and PMC member. I uh, authored a book to do with Spark, uh, and these days uh, I'm involved in a lot of uh, you know, deep learning applications. And recommender systems is something that's close to my heart. Um, I spent uh, about three years building a, a startup before IBM focused on recommendation models, and before that, uh, in fact, applied reinforcement learning techniques and some of the stuff that we'll talk about today to online advertising. So this is, uh, this is stuff that I've been working on in the past for a while. So before we get going, just a little bit about uh, CODE, a Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. Uh, I joined this team at IBM uh, a few years ago when it was called the uh, Spark Technology Center. And the team is focused on, at that point, expanding uh, Apache Spark into the enterprise and, and focusing on the communities and data science communities and tools around Apache Spark. Since then, the team has expanded its focus to encompass the end-to-end -end enterprise AI lifecycle out in open source technology. So this encompasses the Python data science stack, more recently uh, deep learning models and frameworks. Uh, of course, Apache Spark is still a big part of that. Um, some projects that I work on, the model asset exchange and data asset exchange, are around open curation of deep learning models and open data sets. And more recently, uh, a lot of focus around model serving of, in terms of open standards and frameworks, as well as tackling fairness and trust in, in AI, so explainability, um, adversarial robustness, and fairness. So we work on all of these different projects, and we're around uh, over 30 open source developers. So today, uh, we'll start with a little re uh, overview of recommender systems, and then do the same thing for reinforcement learning, just at a high level, and then look at how they have been used uh, combined. Um, and then uh, we'll also, along the way, talk about uh, advances in deep learning and the application of deep learning to reinforcement learning and, and how they've been combined, and then wrap up. So the, each of these fields is in itself a, you know, a huge area, uh, so we won't be able to go into too much detail about any, any one, uh, and we'll keep it fairly high level. So recommender systems, you know, why are they important? Well, you know, what do we really care, care about them for? Well, recommenders are, are one of the earliest uh, and probably most commercially successful applications of machine learning technology. Everywhere you look today, you're interacting with a recommendation system or personalization system. They're telling you what movies to watch, what car to buy, what games to play, what websites to surf, who to connect with on social media, what clothes to buy, where to go on holiday, what job to have, um, and even you know, in the medical field and dating. So pretty much every aspect of modern and in particular online and connected life is touched by recommendations and personalizations. According to most stats, up to 30 or 35% of Amazon's bottom line comes from ultimately the recommendation and personalization system. For Netflix, that is rumored to be closer to 70 or 80%. So anything where taste plays a role, uh, we can dramatically increase revenue, and a big portion of the revenue comes from a recommendation system. So the entities that are involved in our system are typically users and items. Now users, obviously, they're kind of the ones coming into the system and interacting with it. They're effectively creating the data that we're going to use. And items can be anything, as we saw before holidays, books, movies. In this case, we'll just pretend that they're going to be you know, videos online. So we have all this metadata that we want to use about users and items to make better recommendations. We have uh, names, uh, demographic, location, uh, demographic details for, uh, for users. We have geolocation, perhaps. We have activity data. When were they last online? When, were, when was their profile last updated? When were they, were they last active? And for items, we similarly have a lot of metadata in, in, and typically quite rich metadata around uh, what, is, uh, you know, what is contained in that item. So 
for videos, or it may be uh, the actual uh, video itself, the frames, uh, the written, you know, the images in the video effectively. Uh, it can be categories, tags, descriptions. It can also be activity data. When does it last played? How many likes has it had? How many plays has it had? How popular is it? Uh, who is the author? What is the channel it's coming from? All of these are important features that we want to use. And users are coming into our system and interacting with the items in the system. And every time they interact, they are creating event data. So most of the time in recommenders, we hear about explicit data. You know, uh, the canonical models and the canonical data sets and examples are always talking about ratings. So how many uh, stars did, did a user give a, a rating in the movie lens data set? But in reality, most of the data comes from implicit data. So ratings, reviews are explicit statement of preference. I give this a five, I give this a one, therefore I don't like it. Um, but implicit data is all around user behavior where they're not actually telling you what they like and dislike. They're just showing via their behavior. So online, this is a page view, you know, coming to visit a website and looking at a product page may be a very light indicator of preference. It may not necessarily mean that the user likes that, that product, but it is a step towards showing that they like it. If they then add that product to the cart, that's a much stronger indication of preference. And finally, if they buy it, clearly that's a, the strongest indication of preference. But even then, we can't really say that that is an explicit indicator because perhaps someone uh, bought that product and actually didn't like it as much and, and instead of leaving a negative review, just threw it away. We would never know that. So again, an implicit, uh, you know, a purchase is, an, is a strong implicit indicator, but it doesn't necessarily tell us that a user likes that product. And we have all kinds of other uh, information, most of it, uh, most of it implicit, coming from social media, search queries, etc. And every time the user comes and interacts with the system and creates this event, it's done in a certain context. So this is uh, time of day, geolocation, what kind of device are they using? And we want to use this context data to further personalize uh, and improve recommendation systems. If someone is watching videos, for example, on their mobile, on the way to work in, on the train or the bus, they may be open to different types of content than if they're at home watching Netflix on, on the TV. Right? So the context, where they are, what they're doing, what device is quite important in deciding what we want to show them. Now, prediction in machine learning is typically a fairly simple thing. So if you want to you know, classify, you, you take an image and you output a prediction of a cat. Um, or you take a piece of text and you output a pe one piece of sentiment. You're predicting one training example at a time. But prediction for recommendations is a lot more complex. So we need to think about actually ranking items. Our goal really is to present the user at each interaction with a ranked list of items that they want to hopefully interact with. So we want to rank them by some score, and that score is an indication of how likely our model thinks uh, they are to interact with that item. So the prediction is, always, is, is all about ranking. But the challenge that we have is that most machine learning models are optimized against one metric, and that's typically some, some form of loss. And even the same is true for recommendation systems, despite the fact that we are ranking, um, and you know, we need to rank all items for each prediction, we're still ranking based on, let's say, uh, an estimated rating or a estimated click-through rate. But in reality, in a, in a real-world system and in a real-world business, we have a lot of different objectives. So in a business, most of the time, we want to you know, maximize profit. And you know, one could argue perhaps that's the only goal, but we need to take into account uh, short-term and long-term factors. So if we just chase short-term profit maximization uh, at, the, at the risk of investing for the long-term, you know, we may run into challenges. We also need to take into account regulatory factors and societal factors. These are external to the business. So just chasing, for example, click-through rates may not be the, you know, the, the, the best thing. So even though our, our algorithm can only focus on one particular metric, in reality, the business is much more complex and it needs to also take into account a longer time frame. So if we want to you know, uh, uplift revenue or increase user engagement, that may not be the same thing as driving clickbait in the short term. 
One of the other challenges we need to think about when it comes to recommenders is this cold start problem. So most recommendation models are operating under the assumption that we have all the data. We have historical data about what users have viewed what items, what they've purchased, and so on. Clearly, when we add a new item to the mix, when it's brand new, we have no historical data. So we do have metadata about the item, and many models will use the, that metadata to try and improve predictions. So for example, if a user has watched a lot of action movies, and a new action movie comes on, you may want to use that information to recommend that movie to that user, despite the fact that that movie has not been viewed by any similar users. And similarly for new users, or potentially users that were browsing anonymously, or from a new device where we actually don't know them, we can't link back that, uh, that particular device or anonymous user to a profile, we don't know anything about them, we haven't seen what they've interacted with uh, historically. We may have some context data, what device they're using, time of day, geolocation, which may help us if we have a contextual model, but it's a challenge that we need to solve. And finally, another challenge is the dynamics of time. So this applies to both the objective that the model is, is optimizing itself, so click-through rate behavior, for example, or watch behavior, as well as these business metrics um, and, and more complex objectives that we mentioned before. So in many cases, uh, the dynamics of the short term are changing very rapidly. So news articles, uh, videos online, these are examples where popularity is, is normally degrading very, very fast once that is released. And the relevance to a particular user in, in, the, in the news space, for example, is degrading rapidly. So if I'm coming to, to read uh, a news about the latest you know, scandal in US politics, um, yes, some of the historical older articles are relevant. If I'm, and you know, if my behavior is that I'm diving deeper and deeper into that story, that becomes more relevant. But in most cases, you want to uh, have, the, have the most popular and the most recent mix of articles that are, that are displayed to the user. So that this fast cycle of, of you know, new items being added um, interacts with that cold start problem and creates a, quite a big challenge. And in the longer term, tastes can actually change over time. So I may be really interested in you know, US politics currently, but in a few months I may, I may not be interested in that. Um, I may really like cat videos now, but next year I may be into um, you know, mountain biking videos, whatever the case may be. So these dynamics are changing um, both in the, the, the non-near non real-time uh, time frame, so slightly longer than the instant or the, you know, a few days, a few weeks, and they're also changing over months. So we have to take into account that we want to build a system that's going to be able to make those predictions and learn over long time frames. And then finally, we want to maximize those rewards over those long time frames. So, as we mentioned, profitability is, is, one, is one aspect. Um, but user engagement is, a, is not a, a single metric that we can say, well, we've maximized it today, therefore we've won. We want to do that for a given user over a long period of time. So we want to uh, take into account all the changes in behavior um, and create a, a kind of more complex goal where we want to optimize that user behavior, optimize the profitability, uh, in aggregate over long periods of time. So reinforcement learning is actually a good fit for this kind of problem space, as we'll see. So at its most basic, reinforcement learning is around learning by interacting with an environment in order to achieve a goal. That's you know, the, the very, very high level basic of it. And to explain it a little bit more, we'll use a particular type of reinforcement learning, a, a simple version, which as we'll see has been applied to recommendation settings called the multi-arm bandit. So this is probably one of the most simple reinforcement learning problems, but I say simple or simplest here in, um, in air quotes, because while it is quite simple on the face of it, it can become really, really complex and it actually does very well in real world situations. So one shouldn't write it off as being you know, simple and therefore not useful. So the idea behind multi-armed bandits is, as the armed bandits part says, uh, based on uh, this idea of a slot machine, or the one-armed bandit. So the one-armed bandit is, is a slot where the arm is on the side, and you come along and you pull it, and hopefully you win uh, a gazillion euros. But most of the time you don't. 
So there's this concept of a, a reward when you pull or pay off when you pull the arm, um, but it doesn't pay off every time. So there's some sort of underlying probability distribution that is generating the reward. And our goal, if we're sitting at that machine, is to hopefully maximize our reward. Now, in this case, we're, going, we're not going to be talking about uh, you know, costs in the sense of having to pay for this, for this bandit, um, but that, that can be incorporated. So let's take an example with you know, four arms, uh, or four bandits, so it's, it's effectively one bandit with four arms. And this is the, the simplest version of the problem where um, it's the payout is binary. So you either get no payout or you get one. So it's called a binary or Bernoulli uh, bandit problem. So we can see here that each arm has a, a payoff probability. But as the user or as the gambler coming along to pull the arm, I actually do not know what they are. So they're, they're unknown or unseen to me. Now, at each time step, uh, and, and I can only pull one arm at a time. You, you can obviously extend this to, to be, being able to pull multiple arms and having multiple players at a one time step, but for now we'll assume that I can only pull one of these arms at a time. And my goal is to maximize my reward. So at each time step I must pull, I choose which arm to pull, and I want to get the greatest reward over the long term. So this brings us into this concept of exploration versus exploitation. So when we start off, we, uh, I, I have no idea uh, what is the payoff distribution. And I have to balance two things. In order to find out more about the world, I need to explore. So I need to pull an arm and see what happens. And keep doing that. Um, and I could pull one arm, or I could pull both, uh, or four, I, I could vary them. But ultimately, I need to, to start getting payoffs from the arm in order to f start figuring out which one is going to be the most likely to pay out. But if I just keep randomly doing things, the likelihood is I'm not going to really maximize my reward. So at some point, I need to actually start exploiting my knowledge. So once I've learned, hopefully, which one of these arms is the most likely to pay out, well, I'm just going to keep pulling that one because that, over time, is going to maximize the expectation that I have of getting a reward. So this is this quest question about how do I balance the need to explore, to find out more about the world, with the need to exploit in order to maximize a reward. And this is the concept of a policy. I need uh, a plan that tells me at each time step, given what I know about the world, and given what I know about the arms, which one am I going to pull? And that is basically reinforcement learning. So we have this concept of an agent, in this case me, uh, we have an environment, in this case, the multi-arm bandit. And at each time step, I interact with the environment by taking some action, in this case, choosing which arm to pull. Now, the bandit problem doesn't actually have this concept of state, uh, but in full reinforcement learning settings, we have a concept of state, which is the state of the environment. And so at each time step, I receive the state of the environment, um, which could be, you know, if I'm playing um, a, an Atari game, it would be the layout of the, of the image of the game. You know, or what does the screen look like? Or if I'm playing chess, what does the board look like? And when I pull, take an action, I receive a reward. And we'll, we'll talk a bit about rewards next, but the idea is that I receive the reward, and then over time I learn the policy to maximize that reward. So the policy is this mapping from the state of the world and what I know about it to taking an action. So some of the challenges here is that uh, while for the multi-arm bandit problem, for example, the reward is typically immediate. I pull an arm and I get a, a, a reward immediately. In most full reinforcement learning settings and complex scenarios in the real world, that's not true. So take uh, the game of chess. The reward only comes at the end, right? If you win a game, um, you don't want to lose, and you know, a draw is a kind of a split. So you only know at the end of the game, after taking all the actions, what the reward was. And similarly for you know, real-world scenarios or more complex games. The other issue here is that there's, you have partial observability. So I do not know what would have happened if I had pulled the other arms. I only get to choose to pull one arm. So I could pull you know, arm number one and get a reward or no, no reward. But if I had pulled the other arms, I may have gotten a reward because that particular one has a higher probability of paying out but I don't know that. So I can only observe my actions as the agent, and I can't observe everything. 
Um, in some cases, you know, for example, chess, you have full observability. You know, you can see um, you can see all the, the different moves that could have happened, and you see what your opponent did and everything. But in most cases, um, in most real-world you know, situations, you don't are not able to observe everything. Uh, the other challenge is that the, this whole process and these data distributions are in fact changing over time. So as we mentioned in the, re the recommendation space, tastes change over time, the underlying uh, data generating process is changing over time. Uh, and in some cases, the rules of the game are partially defined. So for chess, we're, we're in luck because we know the rules of the game um, and it's fully defined. For, for the simple bandit approach, we're also in luck because the rules of the game are defined. We just, the only thing that's unknown is, is the probabilities uh, underlying those rewards. But in most cases, for you know, complex games like uh, you know, StarCraft or, and, and well, uh, for, for games, actually, that's, it's normally mostly fully defined. Um, but for real-world situations, it's partially defined. So we, we may not know what the actual rules of, you know, of, 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 of a recommendation space are. We don't know the actual um, you know, underlying behavior process of a user. And we have these potentially huge state spaces. So for the state space for multi-arm bandit is uh, effectively you know, the state of each arm, what is, what is the reward that we've received and so on. Um, and the actions that we can take are one of four. And as we expand that more and more and more, and expand that, that bandit problem more and more and more, we get more, you know, greater, greater, greater size of state space. And if you think about uh, the game of Go with its huge branching factors, um, the, you know, Dota 2 and StarCraft, with uh, increasingly large uh, branching factors and uh, state space is effectively what the state of the world that we can receive and the actions that we can take. Uh, that becomes one of, the, one of the main challenges. So some of these, uh, these aspects really differentiate reinforcement learning from normal kinds of machine learning, or well, not normal kinds, but the other two kinds of machine learning, so supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So here in, in supervised learning, we have, we're given a, a label. So we know, you know one training example, we, we're given a matching label, and we, we want to predict a model, well, learn a model that can predict the label given the example. In unsupervised learning, we're effectively learning structure of the data. So we don't have labels, but we, we want to learn the structure of the data effectively, the probability distribution, so that we can make your best estimates uh, of, 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 uh, of that data. And for reinforcement learning, we don't have labels. And so in some sense, it's, it's kind of unsupervised. But unsupervised learning doesn't have this, uh, this concept of, you know, of, of taking actions, partial observability, the long-term timeframes, huge state spaces. So going back to our multi-arm bandit, um, how do we get, go about solving this problem? How do we generate this policy that maps the state of the world to the actions that we want to take? Well, this is, is a, again in itself uh, a huge field and a really deep field of research. Um, but at a high level, we can explore a couple of simple strategies. So the first is obviously we can do nothing. That's not going to be very useful because we're going to get no reward and that's definitely not going to be optimal. Um, the second is the greedy policies, and the third is uh, more principled statistical policies. So for greedy policies, the idea is that we, we want to mostly exploit. Okay, we're going to be greedy. As, we're going to use our knowledge as much as possible to increase our reward. So we could obviously be purely greedy, which is exploit only. So in theory, let's say we could pull each arm and then just go for the arm that, that gave us the reward. That would be, that would be a, a close to purely greedy approach. We then have a slightly more sophisticated approach, which is e epoch greedy. So the idea there is to explore first and then exploit, or to have phases, epochs, of exploration followed by exploitation. So the idea is I would spend a bit of time, you know, 100 time steps, pulling each arm and figuring out uh, what is my estimate of the reward distribution. And once I've done a certain number of time steps, I'm going to go for the one that has the highest expected reward, and I'm just going to keep pulling it until I'm done. I could as I said, interleave those policies, uh, all those epochs in between each other. So I could explore for a while, then exploit for a period, and then go back to exploring just to, just to check if something has changed. And then if we generalize that approach, we get to uh, epsilon greedy, which is that saying with probability epsilon, normally quite small, you know, 1%, 10%, 5%, I'm going to pull a random arm, 
and with probability 1 minus epsilon, I'm going to pull the arm with the highest payoff. So this is a slightly more principled that says I'm going to have a principled way of exploring, but I'm still going to spend most of my time exploiting what I know. So if we take that a little bit further, uh, we have an approach called upper, upper confidence bounds. And the idea here is we want to build a, an estimate of the expected reward for each arm, but we also want to take into account the fact that we don't know everything, so we have uncertainty. Effectively, we, the, if we think about the probability distribution of each arm, we have the mean and we have a standard deviation. So we can think of it as saying, instead of just saying, I'm going to pull the arm with the highest expected reward or the highest mean, I'm going to also take into account the, the standard deviation of that distribution. What this means is that if you have an arm that has a low expected value or expected payoff, but it has a high uh, standard deviation or variance, you may still want to pull that arm to explore because you, you don't yet know, you haven't yet narrowed down your knowledge about that arm. And similarly, if, a, if an arm has a very high ex expected return and a low standard deviation, well then again, you'd want to pull that arm because you have pretty high confidence what the uh, your underlying reward probability is going to be. So effectively, that's what you're doing. You're, you have, you have one component of the UCB, the, the, which is the expected re reward, and you have the bound, the upper confidence bound, which is formed by adding a, a, um, an adjustment based on standard deviation. And in most cases, you know, if you go and look at the literature, UCB will, will outperform epsilon greedy, and for, for non-contextual models, it's going to be one of the best performers. So if we want to be even more rigorous about this from a statistical perspective, we can apply Bayesian reasoning. And that's where we get uh, Bayesian bandits or Thompson sampling. So similar to, to UCB, what we're trying to do here is say, I'm going to start with a prior um, probability distribution on each arm. So I'm going to assign a, a prior. And if I don't know anything, you know, I'm just going to uh, um, assign a kind of non-informative prior that, that is the same across all arms. But I could also take into account any information I might have about, you know, about the world. So if I, if I may know that some arm has got a higher probability, prior probability, I could incorporate that. And then at each time step, I simply sample from those distributions that I have, and I pick the one with the highest, um, the highest sample payoff, and I pull that arm, and then I, I update my probability distribution, I update that prior with, with the posterior effectively with that new information. So in this way, I'm also taking into account the expected value and the variation by sampling, um, but I'm being more principled in the way that I update my, my view of the world. And then the next idea in bandits is to add context. So a simple multi-arm bandit you know, environment or setting is not really going to be um, particularly useful in the real world. I mean, it can be for, for some situations, for things like um, AB, effectively A-B testing, using bandits for A-B testing, um, a small number of examples. But if we think about most use cases in recommendations, for example, online advertising that we might want, might, might want to use these approaches, we're often going to have a lot of items. So now if we think about you know, uh, every news article on our platform as, as a, uh, an arm, right, that could be pulled to display to the user, we can very quickly get into the you know, hundreds, thousands, you know, tens of thousands, even more in terms of items. So that state space starts to become really, really large. And exploring that in any way, and exploring all of it in a principled way is, is effectively going to be impossible. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough you know, traffic or enough information. So the idea behind contextual bandits is to say, can we apply extra variables to our function mapping? So instead of just having a simple expected value and you know, variation, type of approach for each distribution, we can build a, a model, either you know, a linear model in the case of uh, models like LinRel and LinUCB, or a non-linear model, which could be you know, some kind of kernel model or, or deep neural network. And the idea is to map a, a set of features to the, to the reward. So at each time step, we are, we are not, we're not just updating a, an expectation and a variation and so on, but we're actually updating a full linear model. So again, in the case of uh, news articles, you can, you can think about the different features we might want to incorporate. 
Um, and we'll, we'll get to a bit more about recommendations and contextual bandits shortly. Uh, so before we, we move on to a little bit about uh, deep reinforcement learning, uh, we'll just briefly cover some of deep learning and then see how they've, they've kind of combined. Um, so deep learning has been around for quite a long time, since the kind of 1940s, um, and the original computer models originated in the 1960s. This is actually a, a perceptron machine on the, on the right there. So that used to be, that, that was the first kind of multi-layer perceptron back in the 1960s. And these techniques fell out of favor in the, in the 80s and 90s in the kind of AI winter uh, when they didn't really um, live up to expectations. But there's been a recent resurgence due to a number of factors. So we've had bigger and better data. If you think about all the uh, mobile devices, edge devices, uh, the web, uh, cameras that have created rich image data, text data, voice data, and more and more and more of it. And obviously the large internet companies have access to this kind of data as well as standard data sets. So ImageNet, for example, ushered in a whole new era of advances in image classification. So having standard, large standardized data sets available for researchers um, and academics and corporates to use to advance the state of the art. Better hardware is a big factor, GPUs in particular. So as, as the cost and availability of GPUs, well, the cost came down, the availability increased. Uh, you had more and more and more compute power. So you could take the same old model, which uh, couldn't be computed before, and now you can compute it and actually get the result. And of course, improvements to architectures, um, optimization algorithms. So this has led to state-of-the-art results in computer vision, uh, speech and text, language translation, pretty much across the board we've seen, um, and in particular in, in domains with, with rich uh, data, um, you know, text, images, video, and speech. Uh, we've seen state-of-the-art advances. So modern deep learning is all around um, you know, very deep multi-layer networks, convolutional neural networks in computer vision, uh, sequences and time series and applying recurrent neural networks, LSTMs, gated recurrent units, and so on, um, embeddings for text and categorical features, and the deep learning frameworks have played a, a large role, in fact. So frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch give you this flexibility, this concept of computation graphs, automatic differentiation, so you don't have to go and do this by hand, GPU support. So it's allowed a lot of experimentation, rapid development, and increasing, again, the state of the art. Uh, recurrent neural networks, for, for example, have now been uh, very successful in sequence models. So on the left, you have the one-to-one -one approach, you know, uh, image classification, a non-recurrent non model, which would just take one input and give you a, a classification output. You have the one-to-many sequence approach where you have an image input, for example, and you want to generate a, a text caption, which is a sequence of, you know, of words or tokens. Um, Many-to-one, which may be something like taking that sequence of tokens that represents text and spitting out something like a, a sentiment label. And then a, you have many-to-many many -many relationships. So, for example, taking a sequence of English language and translating it to German or labeling each piece of a sequence. So named entity recognition would be taking each word and assigning an entity tag, um, or labeling each frame in a video. So RNNs have been really successful in this space. And these deep learning approaches have increasingly been applied to recommenders. So most approaches have focused on this idea of deep learning as feature extractor. So uh, one example on, on the top right there is to actually take uh, audio files from, I think it was Spotify, and represent them as uh, spectrograms and then apply convolutional networks on top of that to get an embedding. And then in mapping that embedding to the embedding that is generated from a collaborative filtering or recommendation model. So, and, and on the bottom we have a, you know, a wide and deep model which is trying to combine the power of linear models with deep learning. So most of the advances in deep learning applied to recommenders have been trying to use deep learning for what it's really good at, which is extracting, automatically extracting features from rich content, you know, image, text, uh, and then using those features in, in some sort of model. And we also have this concept of an end-to-end -end model. So instead of combining, you know, taking one model uh, and combining it with another in some ad hoc way, training the entire network has become something that's increasingly common across all types of models, and as you'll see in, in reinforcement learning. So the idea is to, to train everything at once in one architecture, all connected, one set of weights or shared parameters depending on the model and ultimately get a better result. And similarly, we've seen advances in applying recurrent neural network architectures. 
uh, so two sequences and sequence modeling for recommenders. So if you treat, if you treat each uh, user sequence or session uh, as a sequence that can be learned, then we can apply with some, um, with a few changes, we can apply much of the same RNN techniques as we apply in text or other sequence models to these challenges. So for deep reinforcement learning, um, and again, for, for RL, we haven't really had enough time to go through all of the different approaches that, that go beyond, you know, obviously go well beyond bandits. Um, but effectively, that, uh, the idea is to combine those uh, uh, state-of-the-art reinforcement learning approaches with the deep learning techniques. So one aspect of that is to take things like, much the same as, we, as for, for the, you know, the way that deep learning does it, is to take uh, aspects of, of deep, sorry, deep learning for recommenders does it, is to take aspects of the deep learning models, you know, convolutional networks, RNNs, and use them to model the inputs for the, for the, the reinforcement learning. Um, and the other uh, idea is to train these models end to end. So if you look at, for example, um, Alpha Star, which is, is beating you know, StarCraft players at professional level, it is a combination of many, many different systems. And part of that is, you know, LSTM networks for in incorporating this idea of memory into, into the, the system, uh, transformers for mapping sequences, state space sequences to action sequences, and combining all of these and training them end to end. And this has been really one of the, the key advances in the space, is combining all these different pieces, training them end to end to get the results. And results have been pretty phenomenal in certainly still in, uh, at the level of, of games or uh, you know, effectively well-defined sets, uh, sets of rules or well-defined structures. Um, so AlphaGo beat the world champion in Go. AlphaZero is, um, I'm not sure if it's actually played any, any uh, the top champion, but it's arguably the top chess player in the world and is superhuman level performance. AlphaStar has beaten professional level humans uh, at, at StarCraft. OpenAI 5 has beat top professional defense of the ancient, Dota 2 or defense of the ancients two teams in, a, in uh, earlier this year. So in areas where the full game rules are understood, but you still have the challenges of uh, huge state spaces, partial observability, you know, long time frames, and, and mapping different, um, different, different reward and kind of complex objectives, we've seen huge advances. So finally, what are some of the applications of the reinforcement learning to recommend the systems? And I'll just highlight a, a couple of key ones. Uh, so as we saw the multi-arm bandit approach, and especially if we, if we think about the contextual approach, maps really nicely to recommending, recommending items that are changing frequently. So this is an example from the a fairly old example now from the Yahoo Today front page where uh, there's four articles that can be selected, and then the main one is, um, is set as the story. And this, int this paper introduced the LIN-UCB algorithm, um, which is effectively an extension of that upper confidence bound that we saw before, but instead of mapping um, uh, you know, a, simple, uh, a simple reward distribution, we use a bunch of features and use a linear model to predict, uh, to, to predict that. And there's also a, a bound, a, a sort of variation or standard deviation based bound on top of that. So it's an extension of this UCB idea. And the, the types of features that they, that they included here are the kind of things that you might expect. Um, your bag of words, tokens uh, from the news stories and the descriptions and, and the titles, uh, demographic and geolocation data for the users. So we, it means that we can bring all of the features that we that we want to use in our recommender models um, and that we're kind of familiar with potentially from, from standard contextual recommendation approaches and apply them in, in, this, um, in this case. So Learn UCB in this paper outperformed Epsilon Greedy and standard UCB approaches on live traffic and was implemented uh, in Yahoo. Uh, one of the other applications is personalizing artwork so uh, Netflix has a couple of uh, blog posts, um, a little bit older now, around which movie artwork to show to each user. So when, you know, if you're generating a recommendation, uh, obviously for, for certain types of, of products or items, 
it's quite visual what you're showing. So you might show different types of, of the, the poster for a movie or, or different images from that movie, something like that. Um, and users may respond to that in very different ways. So they've started, um, they started experimenting with just using bandits, so effectively doing a, a kind of A-B test over, over a more complex A-B test over different input images, and then applied contextual bandits. And what we see here is effectively the, what they call the take fraction, so the percentage of times that a user um, effectively was selecting that image, and, a, and a contextual bandits are again outperforming. Some of the other aspects that, uh, some of the other use cases have been thinking about using bandits as ensembles or to create ensembles. So the idea here is, and I, m I mentioned it a little bit uh, at a high level before, is that bandit algorithms can be used as an A-B test. So if we treat you know, each potential different type of content um, or content option that you want to show as an arm, we can actually generalize A-B testing and be more principled about it. Uh, so, you know, one arm could be a green button, one arm could be a red button, one arm could be a yellow button. And if we take that to, uh, you know, if we expand that idea, then we can have an ensemble of recommender models or, in fact, recommender systems. So we can treat each recommender system as an arm, and underlying that system could itself be a bandit, it could be a collaborative filtering, it could be a deep learning model, it could be an RNN. And at each time step, we use the, the bandit approach to decide which of those systems to feed, uh, to, to actually generate the recommendation. Other recent use cases come uh, coming especially out of, for example, the uh, Rexis conference in the last couple of years, uh, is whole page recommendation. So, and, and this is something that Netflix has also done recently. So the idea is that on each page, and in particular, you know, the front page of, of let's say, a Netflix or a news, uh, news site or a, an online store, you have many, many different ways and options for showing recommendations. You may have a, a, a featured tab, a recommended tab, you may have sidebars, and even on product pages, there's many different ways to show upsells, cross-sells. You may also like in all kinds of different, uh, different locations. So previously, what you might want to do is use a different model for each of those um, and kind of try to, in a fairly ad hoc way, combine them while also trying to avoid, let's say, showing the same product twice in different boxes. And the idea behind whole page recommendation is to, is again, using this, this deep reinforcement learning concept of end-to-end -end training and training the entire system by using reinforcement learning to learn that entire page structure. Another approach is augmenting um, bandits with memory-based techniques. So. We've seen that um, we, have, we have the idea of contextual bandits to have a, a more complex uh, mapping of, uh, of you know, the state to the action space. But one of the things that, um, that can be a challenge is learning over time or, or retaining long-term memory. So bandit algorithms or bandit approaches are, are, are quite good at adapting, especially to, to initial, um, you know, initial uncertainty. So if you start with those four arms that we saw, you don't know anything. These principled approaches, UCB, LinRel, LinUCB, and so on, are really good for rapidly converging on what you think is the, the underlying distribution and exploring and exploiting in a principled way. Um, and the same is true when a new item comes in. When you, so if you think about it, a new item comes in, you have no expectation or no estimate of the expected reward, um, but the variance is very high. So because the variance is very high, your UCB, your, your upper conference bound, calculation can, may end up being quite high, and that means that you end up, you're, you're going to end up pulling that arm quite a lot. So when a new, a new news article comes in or a new video comes in, the, the, the model is automatically going to be in, able to incorporate it and as, an, as a new arm, explore a little bit, and figure out is this going to be popular with users or not. So they're quite good at incorporating that, but in terms of uh, changes in long-term dynamics and long-term learning, um, as we saw, uh, bandits are really about immediate reward. Uh, whereas uh, kind of reinforcement learning and the deep reinforcement learning is around very long-term rewards. Uh, so this is a technique for basically combining, the you know, augmenting the bandits who are not that good uh, over, you know, for, for modeling long-term rewards and long-term changes with uh, RNN memory techniques. Okay, so before wrapping up, um, one final point to make uh, that I want to make is uh, that of evaluation. So most of the time, 
when we are evaluating a machine learning model, let's take a, a classifier, right? It's fairly straightforward. We have a bunch of training data. We train our model on, on the labels. Uh, for evaluation, we maybe hold out a, uh, you know, a test set, an evaluation set, and then we can compute a metric, you know, accuracy, area under the curve, whatever the case may be, that tells us how well we expect that model to generalize, how well do we expect it to predict given new data it hasn't seen. And we can use cross-validation techniques for that. Uh, and we can do the same thing in real life, in real time, we can kind of keep an evaluation going. Um, that gives us an, an idea of how well it's performing in, in, in the wild. The problem with uh, these multi-arm banded and reinforcement learning techniques is that because of we have this, um, number one, we have partial observability, um, and number two, we have uh, this idea of, of a cyclical system. So because we, we don't know what the best outcome was, you know, we only know, uh, we, when we pull the arm, we, we can only pull one arm that we chose. We don't know what the actual best uh, theoretical outcome was, which we do in supervised learning. So evaluating these, especially offline, so off, this kind of concept of off-policy evaluation becomes really challenging. And the cyclical nature of the system means that when we are making recommendations, we're actually influencing the future training data. So there are techniques, um, I won't get, you know, we don't have time to go really into them, but there are a lot of techniques for dealing with this. Um, one way of do doing it is obviously to, to keep some uh, random data aside. So if you think about A-B testing, most of the time you would you do a split test between, you know, 50% traffic sees the green button, 50% traffic sees the red button. But in this case, uh, we may want to keep 5% of traffic that sees something that's kind of random or has no recommendations, for example, and 95%, which, is, is, um, which sees recommendations. And then we can use that 5% of traffic for training better models and for actually doing you know, true evaluation. But this is a, you know, this is a, a challenge and an ongoing research uh, effort. So just to wrap up, in summary, you know, banded-based approaches have been used for a long time in the recommendation space. Uh, there's a, a huge history, wealth of, of research. Um, I provide a, a few links here, but, but certainly uh, there's, that's just scratching the surface. Uh, the more advanced reinforcement learning, and especially deep reinforcement learning, is really just getting started. There's been a few good, good uh, use cases, a few applications, um, but I think in, in, in the sense that advanced, you know, deep reinforcement learning itself is really just getting started. Uh, the application to recommenders has so far been you know, a few in, a few key papers, a few key publications, um, but there's a lot more to, you know, to come. So I'd encourage you if you want to know more, uh, there's obviously, as I mentioned, a lot of links, but the REXIS conferences are, you know, ACM REXIS Rex, is where a lot of the latest advances can be found. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, I just want to briefly mention uh, the, that we're having a free uh, digital developer conference for AI and cloud. IBM is, is offering us for free uh, online uh, in North America, India, Europe, and Asia during November. So if you're interested in, in, in you know, microservices, uh, cloud native development, as well as um, machine learning and AI, I'd encourage you to go and register and take a look. It's completely free. And I'm, there's a few links at the end here. Um, so when, I post, when the slides are posted, the, you know, that's uh, somewhere where you can find more information. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a few questions. One. <laughs> uh, when dealing with uh, systems and machines, I guess it's uh, quite simple to get feedback uh, in order for the model to be trained. And, uh, but when dealing with humans, it's kind of uh, more challenging, might be, I imagine. So are there any tips and, and tricks and your experience that makes this uh, feedback gathering more for the humans to be more compelling to, to, to feedback? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and yeah, I mean, f getting, getting f true feedback in, in any system, certainly in recommender systems uh, and machine learning is, is pretty tricky um, because kind of as I mentioned at the beginning, or close to the beginning, most of the data you have is implicit. So you can ask for feedback, you know, what was your review, what was your rating, um, but this is from, from, from the human into the system. Um, 
but how do you, you know, number one, most of the time they're probably not going to respond. And number two, how do you, you know, how do you align incentives? You know, are, are they are they just are, are they giving a true true rating, a true review? Uh, you know, a lot of the time someone may rate uh, they, they they may rate something differently than what their their behavior actually tells you. So they may rate something four or five, but they actually they don't. The, the preferences tell you that they don't really like that movie as, as much as they indicate. So these are all challenges. I mean, I don't have any you know, hard and fast solutions. Um, you know, incenti incentivizing people to provide feedback is obviously you know, one aspect. Um, I think, I think it, adding explainability is probably an, another area. So again, this is really the, the intersection of the human feedback and the systems I'd, you know, questions or concept. But the more you can explain to users, I think, why they're getting recommendations, so you, you know you're seeing this because you wrote a review that was positive on this, and these are the factors. You know, I think the more that we can explain this um, in clear ways to users, probably the more incentivized they are to actually give good feedback that will you know improve their recommendations. So that that would probably be the only thing, uh, or not the only, but the key thing that I would think about is how to uh, make it clearer to users what why they're getting recommended things, and then that would hopefully improve their their kind of incentives to enhance their own experience by providing both consistent and, you know, true feedback. Is there any, is, is not related to um, reinforcement learning, but um, to spark more, uh, are there any reference architecture or of, uh, you know, machine learning uh, uh, systems uh, implemented with Spark uh, that we can leverage. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're talking about machine learning systems in general, or for a particular application, like recommendations, or. Yeah, in general, I mean. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are there are many, I guess. Uh, Spark itself has a machine learning library. Um, Spark has integrations to TensorFlow. Um, we, you know, you, you can run TensorFlow on Spark for doing doing those libraries, uh, for doing those applications. Um, you know, off the top of my head, uh, we can probably talk offline about it. I'll, I'll have to think of, of some of the some of the you know, places to check out and, and the links. But there are a lot of resources out there for you know how to do machine learning on Spark, how to integrate other machine learning systems with Spark, systems built on top of Spark. Uh, Salesforce has something, for example, called uh, Transmogrify, which is an auto ML system built on Spark. So there's a lot out there. We can probably chat offline to get more. All right. Thank you. Thank you.